<clears throat> we, uh, you know, since uh, Christmas is over with now and um, still got some decorations up, but um, uh, I, I thought it'd be good just to move on to uh, Jesus' ministry. <clears throat> and Jesus, uh, in starting his ministry, there were uh, a couple of prerequisites to starting his ministry. And one of those was getting baptized. Uh, and so we're going to be looking at Matthew chapter 3, Matthew chapter 3, just verses 13 through 17, and we see the baptism of Jesus. Matthew chapter 3, verse seven, 13 through 17. Uh, verse 13 says, Then cometh Jesus from Galilee to Jordan unto John to be baptized of him. But John forbade him, saying, I have need to be baptized of thee. And comest thou to me? And Jesus answering said to him, Suffer to be so now, for thus it becometh us to fulfill all righteousness. Then he suffered him. And Jesus, when he was baptized, went up straightway out of the water, and lo, the heavens were opened unto him, and he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and lighting upon him. And lo, a voice from heaven saying, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. Here we have the Lord getting baptized, <clears throat> and uh, you know, one thing is evident to point out about the Godhead here is that we see the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit all to, all in uh, you could say in unison, but uh, they're they're not the same person because you have a you have Jesus standing standing in the water. Ready to get baptized. That's the mode of baptism is, is immersion where you stand in the water and then you are dunked and then you brought up. That's the biblical way. Just the biblical way. It's not sprinkling. It's not pouring. <clears throat> so Jesus is in the water. And then there's the Holy Spirit, it says, is descending like a dove. It's not a dove, but it's like a dove. And it's, a, it's lighting or coming upon him. So we see two entities. And then also a voice, a voice from heaven. And that's the Father. And he says, this is my beloved Son in whom I'm well pleased. So we see three persons. They say, wait a minute, we have three gods? No, the Bible doesn't teach three gods. It says there's three persons in one God. It's not, it's not God manifests himself in three different ways, although that's true, Jesus is God, the Holy Spirit is God, and God the Father is God, but it's not like they change, uh, or, or, or he's just he's just God changing his form every time. No, there's distinct personages, separate, yet unified in one. You say, I can't understand that. Well, neither can I. In, uh, <clears throat> just for... Uh, uh, Confirmation of that. Look in First John chapter five, verse seven. First John chapter five, verse seven says, "For there are three that bear record in heaven: the Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost. And these three are one." Now it says, "The Father, the Word, and it's a capital W, meaning it's meaning that that Word <clears throat> is personified. That's the Lord Jesus Christ. He's the Word of God. That, uh, uh, he's the Word." Uh, made flesh and dwelt among us, the Bible says. So uh, we have three entities in one God. The Bible calls it the mystery of godliness, okay? So it's a mystery. It's not really well revealed. Uh, and really, uh, who knows if we'll ever really understand the, the, the magnitude or the, the complexity of what the Godhead is. But we do know what God has revealed. And he's revealed it through his scriptures that there are three persons in one God. We call that the Trinity. So uh, in looking at the baptism of Jesus, we uh, we learn some things about um, the, the purpose of it. We learn uh, about the profession that was made about Jesus himself. And also uh, we learn about the uh, uh, point in there. I want to make sure. Don't lose it. The power. Yeah. The power from this baptism. And uh, first of all, we're going to look at the purpose. And 
the purpose of this baptism was consecration. Consecration. Now, what's consecration? Consecration is setting apart something, maybe a person, maybe some furniture, setting something apart for the purpose of God. Consecration. Uh, it, it, in other words, it's a, it's a devotion uh, of something given up to God. And, I, and, and uh, when we're looking at anything in the New Testament, there are always what's called shadows in the Old Testament. So in other words, some truth we see in the New Testament, we can look back and see some other, get some other understanding of that as we look in the Old Testament. And sometimes the Old Testament is very difficult to uh, to uh, uh, understand. God, why did you do it that way? God, why why is I mean, apart from the New Testament, the Old Testament seems sometimes very foolish. It seems very almost ridiculous. Why why is God doing it? Why is He requiring this? Why do you do this? And and when you look at the new, when you have the 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 the, uh, the New Testament that has a uh, it's, it's really the key to understand the Old Testament. So I want to, when we're talking about the baptism of Jesus, and it's about consecration, let's look in the Old Testament. In Numbers chapter 8, the Levites, this was one of the tribes of Israel that were set aside for the service of the temple, for the tabernacle. And uh, they, were the, they were the servants of the Lord. Uh, and and uh, everybody's a servant of the Lord, really. But the thing is, they had the special duties given by God. And in Numbers chapter 8, uh, verse 11 through 14, we see their consecration that God instituted, giving the instruction to Moses. And it says in verse, Numbers chapter 8, verse 11, And Moses shall offer the Levites before the Lord for an offering of the children of Israel, that, that they may execute the service of the Lord. See, that's for the service of the Lord. And the, and the Levites shall lay their hands upon the heads that thou shalt offer the one for a sin offering, the other for a burnt offering unto the Lord to make an atonement for the Levites. That thou shalt set the Levites before Aaron and before the son, his sons and offer them for an offering unto the Lord. And thou shalt separate the Levites from among the children of Israel and the Levites shall be mine. Now see, this was taking this group of men uh, a, a tribe, really, of of the nation of Israel, twelve tribes. Is, is, uh, the Levites were specially chosen uh, to have a, a certain office and function uh, in the service of God. And it says that they're the Lord's. Now there are some things that they were deprived. They they weren't uh, entitled to having a geographical uh, 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 land carved out for specifically the Levites. No, not like Judah had, not like Benjamin, no, not like Naphtali, not like uh, uh, Issachar, not like all these other tribes. Uh, Ephraim had all their different territories. This is our territory. Levites didn't have that. Levites could, they had their villages that they lived in, and <clears throat> they could live in a certain, they could live a, amongst all the other tribes, but they didn't have their own identity, and I, they couldn't identify geographically, this is our land. So this is something that they, you could say, lost out on, but they were the privileged ones to serve the Lord and serve in the temple. Uh, uh, they were consecrated. <clears throat> Excuse me. It says, uh, uh, thou shalt separate the Levites, verse 14, thou shalt separate the Levites from among the children of Israel. See, consecration is separating uh, an individual or separating, let's say, uh, my guitar. I have this guitar here. I use it. I play it for church and all that. I don't play it in a club. I don't play it in the lounge. Uh, <clears throat> I'll play it for enjoyment sometimes. But it's always truly, if my life is uh, consecrated to the Lord, that, that guitar, and I'm going to play it, it's going to be consecrated to the Lord too. Um, everything we have should be set apart for the Lord. But we ourselves should be set apart for the Lord. This is what Jesus was, this was happening when he got um, uh, uh, baptized. He was being set apart. Now, now, there's another Old Testament verse I want to go to in, in Exodus, <clears throat> excuse me, Exodus chapter 29. And uh, it, it gets a little deeper, <clears throat> again, talking about consecration. But this is now, among the Levites, there were the priesthood. 
the priests now, they uh, the Levites were special people who were privileged to be priests. Not every Levite, though, was a priest. And it says in, in Exodus chapter 29, verse 19 and 20, And thou shalt take the other ram, and Aaron and his sons, and shall put up and put their hands upon the head of the ram, and then thou shalt kill the ram, and take of his blood, and put it upon the tip of the right ear of Aaron, and upon the tip of the right ear of his sons, and upon the, the thumb of his right hand, and upon the great toe of his right foot, and sprinkle the blood upon the altar round about. <clears throat> now, <clears throat> this is, again, there's one of these strange things in the ritual of consecrating the priest to be uh, before he could be in the service of the temple or the or the tabernacle at this time, but they had to take <clears throat> the ear and put after they sacrificed the animal, take some blood and put it on the right ear of uh, of the priest and put it on his right thumb and on his the big toe of uh, the right foot, uh, the big toe on his right foot. So uh, again, why is that? Well, <clears throat> truly. It's, it's to consecrate his whole body and his whole actions. Every He's supposed to be one listening to God's voice. Consecrated again. He's specially set apart to hear God's word, to hear God's command, to hear God's voice. <clears throat> and also his hands are to be in God's service. Not supposed to be touching unclean things. Not supposed to be involved in any <clears throat> wrong enterprise. Uh, is what his work is, is supposed to be consecrated to the Lord. And wherever he goes, every, wherever he goes is, is of great importance so that he's, so he's staying right with the Lord. Now, this is Jesus. Maybe we just say Jesus got baptized. This is what happened. Well, we don't see all this happening, but this is the, the scope of the magnitude of what's taking place. And <clears throat> Jesus was, again, not doing, uh, uh, or I should say, this is this is submitting yourself to God's will, not your will. And this with baptism, really, we can even say in the Christian sense of Christian Christian baptism, that's what it is. It's submitting yourself to God's will in your life. It's it's uh, it's setting your apart for setting yourself apart for God's service. We're not our own. We're bought with a price. The Bible says, with the blood of Christ. And just as those lambs and bulls and goats were sacrificed and the blood was applied on the ear and hand of, or thumb and the big toe of the, of the priest, so we are bought with a price, the blood of Christ. And that's, and, and as we are, we should be consecrated unto him. We should be set apart for his service. Jesus, uh, uh he says in John chapter five, verse 30, I think it's worth noting. He says, I can of mine own self do nothing. As I hear, I judge, and my judgment is just, because I seek not my own will, but the will of the Father which has sent me. See, this is consecration. This is saying, Jesus was 30 years old when he got baptized. It's the start of his ministry, but not really quite yet. <clears throat> but he was, this was a, this was a, uh, 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 a pre prerequisite to actually his ministry, and every Christian we can even say has the same purpose. When we get saved, we should be baptized. Now people say, "Well, it's the first step of obedience." Well, I think there's a lot of obedience that we do, really, just coming to the Lord, is obeying the gospel. Uh, but the thing is, when we're when, when a person gets baptized, when a Christian who trusts Christ as Savior and submits to the ordinance of baptism, what they're really doing is consecrating themselves to the service of the Lord. That's the picture. That's the picture. Uh, you know, as a matter of fact, I think that's, that, that it should be, a in our church, it definitely is, a requirement for membership. Membership in a church. You need to be saved. You need to be baptized. And that baptism is a is a sign of a willingness to be consecrated and to be used for the Lord yourself. Not my will, but thine be done. Jesus said that in the Garden of Gethsemane, didn't he? Now, Jesus has a threefold ministry. 
that he's being prepared for. And uh, he came in three ways. The first was he was a prophet. In Luke chapter 4, verse 18, it says, The Spirit of the Lord came upon me because he hath anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to preach deliverance to the captives and recovering of sight to the blind, to set at liberty them that are bruised, to preach the acceptable year of the Lord. Jesus was a prophet. And that's this was his as his uh, three and a half years walking uh, on this earth, uh, this was his, that was his office at that time. But that wasn't his only uh, purpose and function in service uh, to the Father. Uh, and we can even say service to us. Because it does say he gave himself to be a ransom for many for us. It was for us. Uh, in Matthew chapter 20 verse 28 it says even as the son of man came not to be ministered unto but to minister and to give his life a ransom for many for many minister means to serve we have people who are called prime ministers or members of parliament that are ministers and uh, they're supposed to be servants to the people they're not supposed to be kings queens uh even princes they're supposed to be servants what we call public servants. Well, uh, what does that mean? That means they they uh, minister, serve the people. What are you supposed to be? That's what the title uh, tells us. And this, but this is exactly what Jesus did. Jesus lived a life, and his ministry was not about gaining wealth. It wasn't about gaining acclaim, even or gain. It was all about ministering to people. What did he do? He healed the blind. He healed the sick. He uh, he raised the dead. He preached the gospel to the poor. All of that was that verse was saying. All these functions to minister to hurting and needy people. See, this is the consecration that God wants us to have as well. As we're consecrated, Lord, what? Minister to others. It's not about you. It's not about me. Let me say, it's not even about our church. It's about ministering to one another, for sure, but ministering to even people outside of the church. We need to be different. And listen, as Jesus said in the, in the Sermon on the Mount, if you only if you only uh, uh, say hello or, 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 or greet those who are your friends or family, what, different, what difference are you than the lost people? You just... You're no better and no different than them. What makes the Christian different is he breaks out of that comfort zone of family and friends and he can minister or serve or help other people who really uh, he has less attachment to. That, that makes a difference. That makes a difference in the world. That's what we're consecrated for. <clears throat> also, Jesus was a high priest. Or he becomes, he is, is in this stage right now, at this time uh, in our history, uh, in, in our life, uh, Jesus is the high priest. See, because he died on the cross, he rose again from the dead, and the Bible says he ascended up into heaven. And what's he doing there? Well, the Bible says he's interceding for us. In other words, we pray and he's our intercessor. He uh He's our, uh, he's the middle person. He's the mediator, the Bible says. And truthfully, the Bible says there's only one mediator between God and man, and it's the man Christ Jesus. Now, many, there are many religions have different mediators they think to get to God, and usually many different things to access God. You know, they might even have uh, superstitious relics, you know, uh, <clears throat> even in, in the, and it seems sort of funny, but it, I think people really do think this. Um, you know, like a lucky rabbit's foot or, or maybe, uh, some kind of charm or, or some kind of relic. And they think, oh, this will get me closer to God. And this will give me special, uh, grace with God. Well, the Christian really doesn't believe that. Uh, the Christian doesn't see that in the Bible. Uh, what the Christian relies upon is the Lord Jesus Christ. He's the one who we go to. Say, so, yeah, but he's not here. He is here. He says, I'm, I'm with you. Uh, uh, I'll never leave you nor forsake you. He says, uh, 
Uh, he's uh, got all power of heaven and earth, and he's with us always. So uh, uh, even though he's risen, he is here, but he is in heaven. And the Bible says we pray to him. What? He's our intercessor. In John chapter 16, verse 26, it says, At that day you shall ask in my name, and I, sh and I say not unto you. Uh, let me read that again. At that day, ye shall ask in my name, and I say not unto you, that I will pray the Father for you. I think I got that verse. I think I took one verse out of, out, out of the context. But he, but really, he's going to pray. The, uh, Jesus didn't say that before. Uh, the next verse, and I don't have it in my, take a while to get to it. But uh, he said, I will pray for you. He said, I didn't ask you to do this before, but now I'm, I'm telling you, I will pray for you. And verse uh, in Romans chapter 8, verse 34, it says, Who is he that condemneth? It is Christ that died, yea, rather that is risen again, who is even at the right hand of God, who also maketh intercession for us. No question about it. Christ is the one we pray to. There's no, there's no other person we pray to. There's no other um, uh, uh, <clears throat> action that we can perform that gets a special of uh, uh, access to God. No, it's simply that Jesus Christ died on the cross, rose again, and he's pleased the Father, and therefore we go through Jesus. So why can't you go just right through the Father? Well, you don't understand who you are, and you don't understand who God is. You are a sinner. I'm a sinner. Uh, we are uh, separated from the holiness of God. And Jesus is the go-between. He's the middleman. That's why we go to Jesus to pray. There's no other one. There's none other name among, uh, under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved, the Bible says. Also, so this is presently, but in the future, his ministry is the king, the king of kings and lord of lords. We see that in Revelation chapter 19. But in Luke chapter 19, also Luke chapter 19, we see uh, Jesus proclaiming that he is the king. Now, many times you read in scripture that uh, Jesus told his disciples or told uh, people who he healed, don't tell anybody. <laughs> and you think, you think he would say, hey, uh, I've healed you. Tell the world, you know, tell everybody what I've just done for you. He doesn't do that. You say, why? Why didn't he? It was, it's great news. Jesus said, and many times he would tell them uh, when he healed a leper, he said, go to the temple and show yourself to the priest like it says in the Old Testament you're supposed to do, that now you're cleansed. Jesus came to fulfill all scripture. Old Testament scripture. There was no New Testament. It was, you know, the, the Jews call it the Tanakh. He came to fulfill the scripture. One day he will be the king of kings and lord of lords. At the time when Jesus was the prophet, that was the portion of his ministry to be the prophet. But he was going to be the king. He was heralded to be the king and prophesied to be the king in the Old Testament. He would fulfill those promises, but it wasn't the time yet. And therefore, if Jesus was going to tell the world that I'm here, well, listen, he'd be, He'd be uh, short-circuiting his ministry of being the Savior. Because don't you know, those people would have held him and taken him and raised him up, and you're going to be our king. And it would have been a mob to do that. And that's why many times he hid himself away. Because he knew the power or the, let's say, desire of the people to want to have a king. We want a king. As a matter of fact, the Jews are looking for the Messiah. Was he? He's a king. Uh, everybody's looking for a political, governmental ruler who will save the day, save the nation, save the world. We need a man to, to bring us all together. And that'll be the Messiah. That'll be the King of Kings and Lord of Lords one day. And he'll bring us, he'll bring righteousness, which there'll be no real unity unless there is righteousness, but he's going to bring righteousness. But, but see, Jesus, recognized and he understood that you cannot have him as king 
unless you first have him as Savior. And that's in your life and in my life and in really in the in the history of, of, of this, this creation of this uh, of, of God's plan is that we a person must have their sins forgiven first. He had to be the suffering Savior before he could be the reigning and ruling king. He wasn't going to short circuit that. He knew his ministry. And he knew he couldn't let this the, the, the people get out of control and force him to be the king. It wasn't right yet. After his resurrection, yes, after his crucifixion and resurrection, he's ready to be king. And just before his crucifixion, as we call it that Easter week or pot we call Palm Sunday. In Luke chapter 19, verse 36, it says, And as he went, they spread their clothes in the way. And when he was come nigh, even now at the ascent, descent of the Mount of Olives, <clears throat> the whole multitude of the disciples began to rejoice and praise God with a loud voice that all the mighty works which they had seen, saying, Blessed be the King that cometh in the name of the Lord. Peace in heaven and glory in the highest. And some of the Pharisees from among the multitude said to him, Master, rebuke thy disciples. And he answered and said to them, I tell you that if these should hold their peace, the stones would immediately cry out. <laughs> Listen, there are people that said, here's the king. And there are others that said, Hey, that's not right. He's not the king. Jesus, you better tell them to, to get it right. And Jesus said, no, no, no. They do that. If they were to keep their 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 uh their silence, the stones would cry out, because I am the king. Oh, don't you think they had frosted those Pharisees? Surely they didn't look at Jesus as the king. They didn't want him to be the king because honestly, they were in control of a lot. And they didn't want to lose their position and power. Sounds like people today. Anyway, Jesus is a prophet. He's a priest, high priest, and he is our coming king. And so this is his ministry. And he came, is, is even in the baptism, when John the Baptist said, hey, I don't deserve to be uh, baptizing you. You should be baptizing me. In other words, John recognized that his consecration was to Jesus. And he even said, I must he goes, he must increase, but I must decrease. Listen, that's in your life and in my life. He should increase in your life, and we must decrease. We're so full full of self. That self uh, that always wants its way. It always wants to have its own comfort. It wants to have its own purpose. It wants to have its own exaltation instead of God's exaltation, instead of God's purpose in our life. But he's Jesus. Uh, but Jesus said to uh, John, He said, "Suffer to be so to fulfill all righteousness." And this is what Jesus did. He fulfilled all righteousness. Everything he did was to, as I said before, to fulfill the Old Testament promises. In Romans chapter three, verse twenty-five, Paul writes, "Whom God has set forth to be a propitiation through faith." In his blood to declare his righteousness. In other words, his right to declare his righteousness for the remission of sins that all pass, that are passed through the forbearance of God to declare, I say at this time, his righteousness that he might be just and the justifier of him which believeth, believeth in Jesus. Now that's all saying this, that it's Jesus's righteousness that actually is presented to us. As being the the uh, the acceptable offering to God the Father. In other words, it was Jesus' righteousness. Now we many times, uh, I, I should say, all the time in religion, in its human nature, to say, "Well, what about my righteousness? My righteousness? My righteousness?" Your righteousness ain't worth anything, and neither is mine. In Titus chapter 3, verse 5, it says, Not by works of righteousness which we have done, but according to his mercy he saved us, by the washing of regeneration and renewing of the Holy Ghost. See, it's we, religion 
looks at man as pulling himself up by his own bootstraps, turning over a new leaf, making himself a better man. You know, uh, whatever. And it's usually by putting on a new suit, uh, getting a haircut, uh, getting a promotion at work. Uh, uh, you know, uh, I'm gonna, I'm gonna make a, you know, make a vow. Uh, I'm gonna be a better person. Well, those are all admirable things. No question about it. I like a new suit too. <laughs> I like, uh, uh, cleaning myself, making myself a better presentable person to society, to pe other people, and even to be devoted more to God. And this is your righteousness. This is my righteousness. But that does not make you righteous before God. Our righteousness, the Bible says in Isaiah chapter 64, verse 6, it says, your best works of righteousness are as filthy rags. See, that's what he said to Israel. He didn't, you know, he, he, he was telling them that they need a Savior. Now listen, uh, Jesus came to be the Savior of the world. And, and mankind is always trying to uh, 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 console himself that we're really not that bad. Oh boy, if you could just see, if we could just see our, uh, uh, see ourselves in the way God sees us. We are sinners. Hopeless sinners. The best works of righteousness cannot get us right before God. What do we do? We need a Savior. And God provided. That's why he came. He's the righteous one. He fulfilled all righteousness. So we see the purpose of this baptism was this consecration, this righteousness, this righteous life that Jesus, and this righteous ministry that he was going to carry out. But also we see the profession in Jesus' baptism. The profession. What's that mean? That means the voice that came from heaven it said, oh, oh, and lo, a voice from heaven saying, this is my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased. Now, uh, there's other times that this was said in the Bible, a voice coming out of heaven. Uh, one, uh, one time was at the uh, transfiguration. That's when uh, Peter, James, and John, they went up to the, this mountain top with Jesus, just Jesus and these three uh, disciples. And they went to the mountaintop. And the Bible says, that the uh, that a uh, a that Jesus became glistening white, his uh, his uh, garments became white as snow. The Bible says, and also appeared to that alongside Jesus was Elijah, an Old Testament prophet, and Moses alongside Jesus, and they were talking among these three. Moses, Elijah, and Jesus are talking among themselves. And Peter, James, and John are, uh, I'm sure, a, a, a bit of a distance away, and they're no, they're looking at this, and they're just amazed. They're amazed, and and the Bible says Peter says when he sees this, Lord, let's stay up here and let's make a, a tabernacle for for you and for Moses and Elijah, and we're going to stay up here and just worship you men. As Peter said, now Peter was always one to. Uh, not really went necessarily quick thinking, but he was quick with his mouth. Uh, before he was thinking, his mouth would go before he would really be thinking. And and so uh, uh, this wasn't right. This wasn't right that he should be worshiping Moses. Wasn't right that he should be worshiping Elijah. Worshiping Jesus, yeah. But he said all three. Well, Bob says a cloud came down upon them. And in the uh, from the cloud, a voice came out and said, this is my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased. Hear him. Hear him. In other words, he's the one. Not Moses. Now Moses said a lot. Of, Moses, the Bible says the law came by Moses. But grace and truth came by Jesus Christ. Elijah was a great prophet. He could call down fire from heaven. Uh, he, could, uh, 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 he had a great uh, rapport with God, no doubt. Uh, and he did, did a great, uh, was a great witness for the Lord. Uh, but Jesus didn't really come down to judge people and condemn them. Jesus came to save them. So God's saying, listen, okay, that was then. That was in the Old Testament. So, and that's true. Uh, the, those, those were appropriate. And God is a holy God and he's a judge as well. And God does send people to hell. Right now. 
We're not talking about that. We're talking about somebody that is, who has come, who has been given to bring salvation, not to condemn. And so this voice came out of heaven. Um, also, there was another time in Jesus' ministry that a voice came from heaven in John chapter 12. And this is before Jesus was going to be crucified, before his his uh, 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 before his arrest, but definitely before even before his going to the Garden of Gethsemane to pray. But he's with the disciples and others. And in John chapter 12, verse 29, it says, Now is he's, Jesus says, Now is my soul troubled. And what shall I say? Father, save me from this hour? But for this cause came I unto this hour. In other words, the time of his, he's coming to the place of uh, the, the close of his ministry uh, as, as, the, as the Savior, or I should say as the prophet, and he's going to die on the cross. And he says in verse 28, Father, glorify thy name. And it says, then came there a voice from heaven saying, I have both glorified it and will glorify it again. And the people, therefore, that stood by heard it, heard it, said it thundered. And others said, an angel spake to him. Jesus answered and said, this voice came out, came, came not because of me, but for your sakes. Now is the judgment of this world. Now shall the prince of this world be cast out. And I, if I be lifted from the earth, will draw all men unto me. This he says, signifying what death he should die. See, if Jesus is lifted up, lifted up how? Lifted up on the cross. If I be lifted up, I shall draw all men unto me. This is how he wanted to be drawn, drawing men to him as the Savior. See, men weren't looking for a Savior. And today, people aren't looking for uh, a Savior from their sins. They're looking for a Savior for, their, for the economy. They're looking for a Savior for political unrest. They're looking for a savior to uh, whatever heal their heal their heal their broken body. They're looking for material, physical things that they can enjoy, so they can enjoy this life. Well, listen, you know what God the Father says? What about me? What about me? I made you. I made you to please me. <laughs> That's what God the Father said. And Jesus pleased the Father, and G and the Father glorified Jesus. Because Jesus was consecrated to him. Again, that was his purpose. In, in Isaiah chapter 53, verse 10, it says that, Isaiah 53, verse 10 says, Yet it pleased the Lord to bruise him. He hath put him to grief when it shall be, he shall make his soul an offering for sin. He shall see his seed, he shall prolong his days, and the pleasure of the Lord shall prosper in his hand. It says it pleased the Lord to bruise God, bruise Jesus Christ. That means when Jesus died on the cross, he was fulfilling the Old Testament uh, um, requirement for a Savior to be given for the sins of the world. And it pleased God the Father to send Jesus to the cross. What a terrible thing to go to the cross. What a very uh, a, a gruesome thing to go to the cross. What a very uh, even repulsive thing to be nailed to a cross to please the Father. Oh, why is he a, a, a masochist? Uh, God glories in this pain and suffering? If we understand our Bible and we look at our Old Testament, we see God has been saying this from the beginning, that he's offering us a pass to judgment. God is offering you and me a pass to the judgment, the impending judgment of God upon our sin. In the Old Testament, there was always a animal that they took and they killed. And they killed the animal and they presented the animal on an altar before God. Why did they kill the animal? Judgment. Judgment on sin. Well, why? Well, who, did the animal sin? We had to kill the animal because the animal's a sinner? No. The animal was a substitute. That bull, that gold, goat, that lamb was a substitute for the sinner who was offering it. And Jesus, 
The Bible says, is the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. We, we look to Jesus Christ for uh, and present him before the Father, saying, Father, here's the offering that you've given us, and we're 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 looking to this offering, this blood that was shed, this this uh this righteous one who was sacrificed as our to cover our sin, to make us free from the guilt of sin, to make us forgiven, because he took our place. See, when the lamb was taken on the altar and killed, or killed and put on the altar, the person who's doing it should have been killed and put on the altar. But see, God has put a premium on mankind and said mankind is the highest of his creation. Not the animals. And we love the animals. <laughs> But the animals, the Bible says, are for the service of man, just like everything in creation. But God has put the premium on mankind because mankind was made in the image of God. And God wants to save them from the accountability that they have before him as well. And the Bible says, all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. There's none righteous, no, not one. It's, oh, come on now, there must be some righteous people. Not not righteous enough to enter into heaven. None. You know, one there was one time in history where God blotted out the whole creation through the flood. He saved just one man to save humanity and his family through the through the through the ark. But he wiped out the whole all his sin and come short of the glory of God. And uh I'm, just gonna, I'm not going to go to the scripture, but uh, at the same time, God was pleased with, God's pleased with, um, uh, he was pleased to make us. He's pleased with his creation. You know, in the sixth day of creation, uh, he, he created the earth, the Bible says, he created the world in six days, and on the seventh day he rested. And they rested wasn't me, boy, am I tired. That rested was he was enjoying and he was pleased with what he had created. That's how the initial, that's how mankind started on this planet. Everything was good. He said, it's very good, as a matter of fact. After the seventh day when he created, uh, uh, or after the uh, sixth day when he created Adam, um, and Adam and Eve, uh, it says on the seventh day he rested. And that means he, he saw this as a good thing and it pleased God. It pleased him, the Bible says, he made to make Israel. It pleased him, uh, or I should say, our stewardship in our life, in this life, is to please God. Your life, my life, the purpose of my life, and the purpose of your life is to please God. That's the main, that's the main thing. So you might say glorify God, but it really is to please God. And we need to manage our life in that fashion. In Matthew chapter 25, Jesus gives a parable, but it's very uh, pointed on, on how we are, uh, how we should be responsible before God with everything that he's given us. It's a parable of the talents. And he says in Matthew chapter 25, verse 23 in this parable, uh, his Lord said unto him, well done, thou good and faithful servant. Thou hast been faithful over a few things. I will make thee a ruler over many things. Enter thou into the joy of thy Lord. There is going to be an accountability for our life and how we please the Lord, how we manage as a steward everything that God has entrusted us with. What's he entrusted us with? First thing we always think about is money. But the thing is, that's not the only thing he's entrusted you with. He entrusts you with a body. How are you using this body? Are you using it for him or are you using it for you? Oh, uh, it's my body. I think, no, it's not your body. The Bible says you're bought with a price, with the blood of Christ. You're not your own. And so therefore you can't do all the things you would like to do with this body. Yeah, same thing with your money. Same thing with your relationships and your friendships. No. How have you used these? Have you used them for your liking? Or have you used them, or let's say, have you excluded some to your liking? 
Well, God said, no, 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 I want, you, I want them to be part of you. I want them to be part of your association and friendship and companionship. In other words, who's in charge? Or what's this, what's your life for? Is it for you or is it for God? Is it to please you or is it to please God? It's to please God. That's why God gave you that life. Paul said it this way. For I do now, uh, he said, for do I now persuade men or God? Or do I seek to please men? For if I seek, for if I yet please men, I should not be the servant of Christ. Now, sometimes there's other people that you think, well, they own me. It could be your parents. Your parents don't own you. God owns you. No, but they're over and I have to obey them. Yes, you need to obey them. Why? Because God said so. That's why. That's the only reason why. Because God said so. Uh, you know, I got to do exactly what the government tells me to do because they're, they're, uh, you know, they're going to shut my water off if I don't or whatever. It's like, well, why should you obey the government? Because God says so. That's why. That's the only reason why. Uh, whether it's your boss or any other authority in your life, it's only because God says so. You worship God. You serve and please Him. What if you don't want, what if you don't like the government? What if you don't like your parents? What if you don't want to do what they tell you to do? You say, well, I'm not going to do it now. Because I don't like what they told me. You should still do it. Why? Because you're, tell, because you're serving God. You're pleasing God. You're not pleasing yourself. I'm not saying every authority is right. And I'm not saying even obeying every authority is right. I'm just saying everything, whether we are obeying authority or even disobeying authority, it's got to be because of God. Because we serve God. Uh, Christian, who do you serve? Do you check every command that comes from people in your life and say, well, let me see. Is this what God wants me to do? They said it, but, you know, uh, let me check. Is this really right what they said according to God? Should I really listen to that? In this day and age, boy, we need to do that more than ever. Don't be a fool. Don't be anyone's fool. Don't think that you're supposed to be anyone's fool. No. Submission to authority it should always be predicated on that we're, we belong to God. And this is what God wants me to do. I serve not men. I serve God. But really, serving men is what God wants me to do. Sounds like a paradox, I'm sure. But in Revelation chapter 4, verse 11, it says, Thou art worthy, O Lord, to receive glory and honor and power, for thou hast created all things. And for thy pleasure, they are and were created. Man's ruin is to seek to please himself without God. That's how we ruin ourselves. That's how you and I ruin ourselves. That's how this world ruins itself. Seeking to please ourselves without God. And that's exactly the, 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 uh, the, the formula Satan always tries to sell us. That's what he always tries to give us. Please yourself. Take a break. Do this or that. Make yourself happy and forget about God. Now you can be happy with God. You can be at, 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 uh, 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 and have a wonderful life with God. But Satan said, no, 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 no. He's trying to ruin things for you. Take away. Isn't that the same, same thing he said to Adam and Eve? In the garden, you know, you shall not die. You know, God's holding back from you. Boy, you're going to be like the gods. You'll be like God if you if you eat of that tree of the knowledge of good and evil. See, say it's the same old thing, and we fall for it every time. What fools! What fools! Listen, don't fall for the the, the devil's lie. Please yourself, right? We fall for it all the time. How foolish! We're wise to say, no, I'm not going to ruin myself by the same, uh, by, in this fashion. No, I am going to be blessed by what? Pleasing God. But let me just look at this. Look at this, how the Bible predicts this is going to be in the last days, how people are going to be. Uh, in 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 1 through 4, uh, the Bible says, This know also that in the last days perilous times shall come. For men shall be lovers of their own selves, covetous, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, 
unthankful, unholy, without natural affection, truce breakers, false accusers, incontinent, fierce, despisers of those that are good, traitors, heady, high-minded. And then it says, lovers of pleasure more than lovers of God. See, who takes precedence in your life? Now, listen, there's some things that we're, uh, that we could please ourselves with, uh, you know, certain kind of foods or, 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 or things. But the thing is, uh, th- there's nothing wrong in those things. And those are things that God would want, want us to enjoy as well, because he says he's given us richly all things to enjoy. But everything has to be tempered with, is this pleasing before God? If anything is not pleasing before God, if anything is out of line, and one of those things I could say as an example would be definitely sex. Sex outside of marriage is sin. You can't be a Christian living in adultery or living in fornication, that's sex outside of marriage, and think that you're pleasing God or think that you're right before God. No, the Bible says God will judge you if you're a Christian doing that. And truthfully, even in the lost, there was, there's judgment because it's taking pleasures that God says, no, it's only for marriage. That pleasure is only for marriage. Say, so, yeah, but I can't, I'm just born this way. I got, I can't. No, no, no. You're, ju- you're just, you're, uh, uh, it's like an addict. You got to go cold turkey. <laughs> so I can tell you. But the only way you can go, tur- go cold turkey is if you look to the Lord and you're submissive to the Lord and you see him as being a good God. See, that's the problem. You don't see God as a good God. You don't see him as a loving God. You don't see him as a, you don't enjoy God. You don't take pleasure in God. You don't delight in the Lord. That's the problem. If you delight in the Lord, if you take pleasure in the Lord, if you, then you know what? You want to be right with the Lord. But if you don't, yeah, that's what's going to happen. You're going to please, try to please yourself. That's what the world tells you to do. And you're doing exactly what the world wants you to do. And you're ruining yourself. You're ruining your life. And you're out of the purpose of God in your life. And you're not pleasing God. Salvation is how we please God. If you're not saved, get saved. Pleases God. The Bible says there's no other way for salvation. uh, But through Jesus Christ. Salvation by faith in Jesus. Pleases God. It says in Hebrews chapter 11 verse 6. For, for without faith, it's impossible to please God. Impossible to please him, it says. For he, hath, he that cometh to God must believe that he is, and that he's a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. It says it's impossible to please God. <laughs> oh, it's impossible to please him without faith. Faith is believing what you don't see, but you have a promise from somebody you trust. Somebody you trust said something. Didn't happen yet, but you believe in what they said. That's faith. It's not blind faith. No. It's, it's faith based upon the authority of which, of who said something to give you that, that, that belief. And what did God do? Well, God gave us his word. He gave us the scriptures. He gave us the Bible. And he said some things here. And if you believe this, and if you believe that Jesus died on the cross for your sins, as it says, if you believe he's the only Savior, if you believe that you that you need a Savior, that's number one. And the Bible teaches all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. There's none righteous, no, not one. If you believe that, what God said, Well, that's faith. And then if you put your trust in him as your savior, boy, that pleases God. And it's that's that's faith. And it's impossible to please God without faith. People say, I I won't believe it. Uh, uh, You know, I'm going to wait till I see it before I believe it. Well, listen, you'll never believe it even if you see it. There's many things that we can be full. We're fooled with even what we see. These eyes don't always give us the real picture of what's happening. I wish I had an illustration for that right now, but I don't. But the thing is, you, you, faith is what pleases God. Listen, doesn't it please a parent 
when a child <clears throat> believes. <laughs> it could even be they believe in Santa Claus. Well, that's a lie. That's a. It's not a lie because Daddy said so. <laughs> Now, the parent might feel a little embarrassed about that when that kid is maybe 9 or 10 years old, and they're still saying that. But you know what? They believe that. Boy, you can't criticize that all. That's faith. What? Faith in the authority. The authority said that. And I trust that authority. I believe that authority. And that's true. In that person's eyes. Listen, we're not talking about Santa Claus. We're talking about faith. What faith is. And faith pleases God. Your faith in him pleases God. God is pleased when we believe the gospel. <clears throat> it says in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 21, For after that the wisdom of, of God, the world by wisdom knew not God, it pleased God by the foolishness of preaching to save them that believe. The Bible says the, it pleased God by the foolishness of preaching. Preaching what? Preaching the gospel. And as people <clears throat> believe the gospel, if they put their faith in what was said, this pleases God. Now, lastly, and I'm way out of time already, is the power in Jesus' baptism. The power in this baptism. It was through the Holy Spirit. The Bible says the Holy Spirit came like a dove and descended upon him. And <clears throat> the Bible teaches that this, uh, this Holy Spirit is necessary in all that we do if we're going to do anything for the Lord. That's why, <clears throat> excuse me, in the consecration, Jesus is submitting himself to this ordinance, but at the same time, he's receiving something from God, and he's receiving the Holy Spirit. <clears throat> now again, <clears throat> this can get very complex when you think about the Godhead, but the Bible says in Isaiah chapter 11, verse 2, and the Spirit of the Lord shall rest upon him the spirit of wisdom and understanding, the spirit of counsel and might, <clears throat> the spirit of knowledge and of the fear of the Lord. There's the spirit of the Lord, and it says he's going to have power because of it. Listen, you and I uh, are, are, are saved by grace through faith, not of ourselves. It's a gift of God, not of works, as St. mentioned most. <clears throat> There's no ritual we can go to to, be, to get saved. Even this baptism. The baptism didn't save Jesus, did it? He didn't have sins that had to be <clears throat> washed away. Why did he get baptized? It was to fulfill all righteousness. It was to show his consecration to the Father and the will of the Father in his life. That's what it was for. As a, as a person, as we are uh, in this time and age, we're, we, we do submit to the ordinance of baptism after we get saved. In other words, baptism doesn't save you. It doesn't wash away your sins. That's, that's a pagan practice. If, if you look at uh, Hinduism, uh, Hinduism today, what they do is they go to the Ganges River and they wash themselves in, in a purification uh, rite. Uh, they, uh, they, this is a Hindu uh, and even pagan, you say, practice. And this is nothing new. This is done with the Greeks and the Romans and Babylonians and Egyptians. They've all had those kinds of uh, washings in water to cleanse, cleanse them and more purified to their gods. But in Christianity, that's not this picture. The picture is death, burial, and resurrection. For when, you're, when you trust Christ as your Savior, that's, spiritually, that's what happens. You, when we trust Christ as our Savior, we die to self. We accept his life for our life. We sacrifice, we give our life to him, he gives us his life. Paul said, I am crucified with Christ, nevertheless I live. Yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. The life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. See, we give our life to him, he gives us his life. That's, that's a spiritual thing to take place. That doesn't happen necessarily in a church. That doesn't happen. That doesn't happen in, in, a, in a religious ritual, baptism, confirmation, whatever you might might want to choose. Now, there's places for these things, those religious things, but that's not salvation. 
Salvation is spiritual. Jesus says in uh, in John chapter 3, he says, That which is born of the flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the spirit is spirit. Marvel not that I send thee, you must be born again. And then he says, The wind bloweth where it listeth, and thou hearest the sound thereof, but canst not tell whence it cometh and whither it goeth. So is everyone that is born of the spirit. Born of the spirit. Not born of the water, born of the spirit. Born again. We're born again by a spiritual transaction that takes place. My life, or his life actually, was given on the cross for me. But the thing is, my life is given to him that I might receive him. I might receive the Holy Spirit. And when we receive the Holy Spirit, that's when we get saved. That instant. It's justification at that moment in time. It's an instantaneous uh, 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 experience. It's not that you speak in tongues. It's not that you have a, a you know tingling uh, feeling going up your back. It's not. It's that you know you receive Christ as your Savior and you're forgiven of your sins. That's it. And you have the Holy Spirit in you. That's the Comforter. It gives you that confirmation. All right. All right. Wonderful. Never forget. Uh, it's it's unforgettable. The event of getting saved. But. We did demonstrate that in the uh, ordinance of baptism in a person in water, going under the water, and coming out of the water. Now, why that? Because that's a picture of death going under the water. When a person goes under the water, it's a picture of when somebody dies, you bury them in the ground. You don't take a shovel of dirt and just throw it on the body and walk away or sprinkle some dirt on them and walk away. No, you you. Put them down six feet deep. You put them down six feet deep. But the Bible says there's going to be a resurrection actually one day, but also there's a resurrection in my life when I got saved. Christ resurrected in me. And so when a person comes out of the water, it's a, it's a picture of a new life now, a new lifestyle. The old life's dead. Christian, remember? That old life is dead. You need to remember that. That old man is dead. And you got a new life. And it's just a picture. It's a picture. It's a representation. It's a little mini drama, you could say, of what happens spiritually to you. And this is why the Christian is supposed to uh, follow the Lord in baptism. It doesn't save you. And this, again, that's religious people that say that who aren't saved. If a, if a person says you're saved because you're baptized, mark it down. They are not saved. Why? Because they don't understand salvation. They think by following this, this physical ritual, religious ritual, that makes, then God is going to have some, whatever, pixie dust come on them. No. It's when your heart, when you release, when you surrender your will to God, willing to uh, uh, accept his forgiveness, through the blood of Jesus Christ, who died on your behalf, when you're willing to accept that, and only that, not just Jesus plus everything else, no, 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 and willing to let go of trusting in that you're a good person, that you're really not a bad person. That's what Satan says to you all the time. That's what your own self says to you. You're not that bad. What does God say about that? There's none righteous, no, not he says that Jesus Christ, he said, he came, in John 3, 16, it says, God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believeth him shall not perish, but have everlasting life. And he says, he, his son came not into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. That's the purpose of Jesus coming. Now listen, you reject Jesus Christ, you'll get the condemnation. You reject Jesus Christ, you trust in your goodness, or you try to think you're trusting in Jesus, plus trusting in, you're not that bad. Well, you're really not trusting in Jesus. you got to let go of trusting in yourself and cling 100% on Jesus. It's not you 50% and Jesus 50%. It's Jesus 100%. See how religion, <clears throat> uh, the best way, the best way to uh, kill a rat 
<clears throat> is with rat poison, right? Set out some rat poison. And rat poison is probably 90%, uh, or maybe I think it's more than that, maybe 98% cornmeal. Just got a little bit of arsenic in it. That kills the rat. That's how religion works. It's got a lot of good that you say, well, they believe in Jesus. Well, they believe in the Trinity. They believe in the resurrection of Christ. They believe in the virgin birth. They read the Bible. Oh, yeah, that's 98% right. But it's a 2% of arsenic that's going to kill you. They don't teach salvation right. That's how they get you. The best lie is the lie packed with a lot of truth. That's the best lie. Religion. Religion to, and those that call themselves Christians. And many people think they're saved or not saved because they belong to a certain church. They grew up in a Christian home. But they never put their faith and trust in Jesus Christ alone. And again, human nature, human nature believes you're not. Listen, we need to be surrendered. Christian, we need to be surrendered to God, consecrated to God. That's what baptism, well, you maybe not recognize that, but, but that's what that actually was trying to, was, was a sign of. It was, just as Jesus was uh, consecrated, that was the purpose of it. And it was, and it pleased the Father. And listen, receiving the power of the Holy Spirit, he did at that point. For ministry, he was, for the life, he was three, three and a half more years. That's what he was going to have. Three and a half more years. That was his ministry, three and a half years. Change the world. Change lives. Three and a half years. But you and I, as we, as we follow God, as we live, as we live a life consecrated to Him, we should be living pleasing in this consecration to, if, that it would please Him. That's our goal, to please God. And to be walking and living in the power of the Holy Spirit. That's what Jesus received. He received the Holy Spirit. And we received the Holy Spirit when we got saved for power. Power over sin. Power to do the will of God in our life. Power to have boldness to preach the gospel. He said you should receive power after, after that the Holy Ghost has come upon you and you shall be witnesses unto me, both in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and under the uttermost parts of the earth. Acts chapter 1 verse 8. Where we receive the Holy Spirit to make us do the things that we wouldn't naturally do or want to do or be able to do. And the thing is, we should want to do what God wants us to do. But the way we should do that is through the power of the Holy Spirit. Much is being done in the flesh. Much, much Christianity is being, being done in the flesh. Many Christians are more pragmatic than really submitted to the Holy Spirit. Many times you have to wait. But this doesn't mean God's disqualified you. Because he's testing you to see if you really are good, are you willing to uh, crucify the flesh and let the Holy Spirit have its will and way in your life and use and be submitted to his will. Listen, again, baptism of Christ was the precursor to um, actually Jesus' temptation with Satan which is what we'll, we'll go into next week. <clears throat> but Christ's baptism and the temptation were his preparation for the Calvary road. Now listen, that's the life of every Christian. As Jesus is our example, we walk the Calvary road too. We walk this Calvary road. Just like Jesus, every believer must be consecrated before he or she is ready to engage in spiritual warfare that we are called to. We're going to be used of God, be pleased of God, then we have to be prepared. And you need, are you consecrated to God's calling in your life? Does your life please God? Do you lead a spirit powered life? And listen, if you're not saved, none of the above, really. So are you saved? Are you saved? If you're not saved this morning, I'm going to give you the opportunity to trust Christ as your Savior. The Bible says, whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. 
you ask them to save you like this. You bow, you, you bow your head wherever you are, and you can pray silently yourself, and I'm going to pray aloud. My prayer can't save you. But your faith released, your faith released in the word of, in the promises of the word of God that he will, through Jesus Christ, that saves. Saved by grace through faith. You pray like this. Lord, I know that I'm a sinner. Because I'm a sinner, I know I deserve your judgment. But Lord, thank you for loving me. Thank you for Jesus and on the cross for my sin. That's why I know how I receive that thy Lord. No longer trust in my good works. No longer trust in my church affiliation. No longer trust in my baptism. No longer trust in my religious uh, uh, attendance to church. I trust in Jesus Christ and him alone. Thank you, Lord, for sending a Savior. A Savior I needed. A complete Savior. The one and only Savior. The Lord Jesus Christ. And help me to live for him. 